Hello Booktube, Sean here. Hope you're all doing well this weekend. Uh, today I want to talk to you about wrap-ups or more specifically my inability to film one that is under 25 minutes uh, long. I've had a couple of goes at my November wrap-up now and uh, it's not gone well. Uh, I don't want to try and edit them down because I think I would lose a lot of the context. So I've decided to go a slightly uh, different route. I'm going. To, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do themed wrap-ups with smaller numbers of books and see whether that works. So these will probably come in somewhere between an average wrap-up kind of spiel and a, um, a full-length review kind of spiel. I've got three nature books that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, one that I read in September, one that I picked up at the end of October as part of the Autumn Readathon, and the final one that I picked up most recently uh, as part of Nonfiction November. I'm going to go from the lowest rating uh, to the highest. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is the book that I read in October as part of Autumn, the Autumn Readathon, and that is The Secret Life of the Owl uh, by John Lewis Stemple. I was really hopeful that this book, although it is very short, and I accept that, that I, I thought it was still going to be packed full of a load of owl-related facts that I was previously uh, unaware of, but it, it, it kind of felt like a bit of a mess of a book, if I'm perfectly honest. It, it covers the cultural history of owls, why so many different cultures um, have had an affinity for this particular family of birds. It talks about literature and where the owl has appeared in literature, so there are, there's a smattering of poems throughout the book. Um, it then talks more about the usual kind of stuff in a nature book around sort of biology and evolution, um, so how the owls eyesight and hearing functions how it hunts uh, those kind of things but it didn't really present me with much in the way of new information most of what uh, is in here i already knew from reading elsewhere or from watching documentaries uh, it feels like it's superficial in all of those areas and i know it's less than 100 pages and in fact that's that's part of the problem as well it's less than 100 pages uh, but this costs eight pounds which even as a primer for somebody who's not read much about owls, if you can find out most of this information in 20 minutes on the internet, then spending eight pounds on this uh, seems like a, a bit of an extravagance. It feels like John, Stemple, uh, John Lewis Stemple was sat at home, his publisher rang him, said, Christmas is coming up soon, John, can you write us something quick uh, that we can get out as a stocking filler to fill the coffers? Uh, and this was the output. So one to avoid, I would say, um, unfortunately. I gave it uh, two and a half stars. Thankfully, the other two books were, were really good. And the next one I want to talk about is the one that I picked up as part of Nonfiction November. And that is um, this one, Horizon for a Curlew by uh, Horatio Clare. I didn't know what that word meant, Horizon, when I first picked up this book. And it means prayer. And maybe if you see the subtitle, in Search of a Bird on the Brink of Extinction, that will make more sense because this is a book uh, about Horatio Clare's search for the slender-billed curlew, which is uh, perhaps uh, one of the, rare, well, definitely one of the rarest birds on the planet. In fact, he calls it Schrodinger's uh, curlew uh, in the introduction, which I think is a good way of talking about its indeterminate state in the sense that we're not sure whether it's actually extinct or whether it's just on the brink of extinction. Uh, the last sighting verified sighting of this was in the early 2000s. Uh, there have been sort of speculative sightings since then. In fact, there's a very famous and much contested sighting in the UK uh, in 1998 on the Northumberland coast, which was originally um, ticked off as a, an official sighting. And then in 2011 on review was actually struck off the list. Uh, still disputed, as I say, but a very rare bird and nobody really understands the reasons why the population has declined so disastrously. Uh, it only started in the 1920s, which is, it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, is relatively uh, recently. The uh, There are speculations that it could be to do with uh, hunting, particularly in Italy and Malta and on the African coast, but also habitat loss and also some speculations that there may have been some impact of the Chernobyl uh, nuclear explosion, given that this bird nests in uh, central uh, Russia and is a ground nester and a ground feeder. It could have been impacted by uh, the kind of radioactive fallout uh, from that explosion. But nobody uh, really knows. And the way that Horatio Clare approaches this uh, journey is uh, the bird almost, the uh, research for the bird almost becomes incidental to 
is travel through Greece, uh, Bulgaria and Romania, meeting a kind of eccentric cast of uh, ecologists, conservationists and ornithologists. The story is really their story. And if it was just about interviewing them about the last time they saw a slender bill curly, which Claire does, it would be a very sad story because those conversations uh, and taking into account the last time that most of these individuals he's speaking to saw one of these slender bill curlies was in the 1990s. Uh, this, so it's kind of a nostalgia filled view of um, looking back on these kind of ephemeral glimpses that they had of these of these very rare birds. Uh, but the conversations are kind of there's almost a tacit acceptance, if, if unstated, uh, that this is a bird that's now gone. It's lost to us. Uh, so they are they are looking back with nostalgia and sadness really so, some of them do fan a few embers of hope that maybe uh, it's nesting somewhere in, in an inaccessible area of uh, the so you know the russia um and wintering in some equally inaccessible area of iran maybe uh, but it seems that most of the people uh, that he's talking to have kind of come to their own conclusion that this bird is now uh, extinct sadly the hope in the story comes from the fact that these individuals that he's talking to, these conservationists, um, have kind of been battling over the past few years, some of them in Romania and Bulgaria, since before the fall of the, the Iron Curtain, to establish reserves, to establish protected areas where habitats uh, can be conserved. And it's almost like they're, they're, there's a legacy to this Lender Bill Curlew there. They, they may not have been in time um, to save this particular species but other species will benefit and these battles are still going on now but some of the things they've achieved are quite already are quite startling against a backdrop of uh, austerity in Greece where conservation is is the budgets are being cut uh, to the former communist countries uh, where, where they've got their own economic woes Bulgaria is being depopulated for example with most of its best and brightest going overseas so that's where the real kind of hope of the story comes in. It's a very short read, uh, less than 200 pages. I flew through it. And if you're looking for a tr sort of travel log with a nature or ornithological bent, uh, then this may be uh, the book for you. As a side note, um, there is another book that I'm hoping to pick up early next year, which uh, is part travel log, part memoir, and covers the same kind of area, Greece, Bulgaria, um, Romania. And that's this one, which was shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize this year, Border, uh, by Kapka Kasabova. Uh, this is, as I say, uh, probably uh, one of the last true wildernesses in Europe. This is a kind of discussion of that particular area, and I think it'd make a good companion read uh, for Horizon for, Cur for a Curlew. Final book. Um, I'm a little bit cautious on this. This was my favourite. I gave it 4.75 stars, so not quite a five-star read. And the reason I'm kind of cautious, and, and it always is the case when I'm reviewing these kind of books, is this is a book written by a ornithologist, a bird watcher, and some of the chapters I think resonate with me because um, I've been a bird watcher and I've been a bird watcher for so long. However, having said that, I think there's enough crossover appeal of this book that people just interested in general nature writing will be able to pick it up and take something away from it and enjoy it. And it is uh, The Crow Country, or Crow Country by Mark Cocker. Uh, this is uh, a book that was shortlisted for the 2008 Samuel Johnson Prize, which is now the uh, Bailey Gifford Prize. I seem to have mentioned that already a couple of times in this video. And it is about how the author, uh, in the early 2000s, decided to move from a city centre, Norwich, uh, which is a city in East England, to a more rural setting in the Norfolk Fens, um, and they move into this kind of dilapidated, damp-filled cottage. And during the course of renovating that cottage, he becomes aware of the movements of the local population of rooks. Um, having always been a bird watcher, he um, obviously notices much of the bird life in the uh, in the local area. But it's the local rooks that particularly take his attention. And it, what be, starts as an interest slowly becomes an obsession, uh, which not only leads him to monitor the rookery closest to where he lives and try and understand the behaviours and 
um, the patterns of travel of these birds, where they're going to, where they're coming from. It leads him to travel the country um, <coughs> as well, excuse me, to view other uh, rookeries and even overseas to Spain. Uh, so some of the book is about that. Some of the book is about his growing obsession where he, he does, you know, he, he has a very self-deprecating sense of humour. So he pokes fun at himself. And there are some moments of, uh, you know, genuine kind of excitement and drama. Um, it sounds like it should be the most dry and boring subject of all time to be monitoring rooks coming and going from uh, the local rookery. But it, it isn't. Um, and some of his travels to go and see some of the other rookeries are quite interesting and drama filled and incident filled as well but the the book is about more than just his growing obsession with rooks um, there is a kind of deconstruction of bird watching more generally in one of the chapters where he talks about the fact that as you become a more experienced bird watcher you tend to gloss over uh, common birds so if i'm out with my binoculars and I see something on a fence post and go, oh, it's a crow. I don't pay any more attention to it. They become invisible to you, more or less. And he says this is a big travesty, really, because there are many of the behaviours um, of common species that we don't fully understand. There's a there's an awful lot of mystery there, even with common species, is his point, and we shouldn't overlook them. And I think that as a sort of commonality with other hobbies, you know, take BookTube, for example, you buy a load of books, you're excited about them, you stick them on your shelf, you forget about them, you get distracted by the latest releases uh, that have just come out. And it certainly makes me reappraise some of the way I approach uh, bird watching um, these days. He also talks about uh, the, he has a kind of part lament about the, the changing landscape of the Norfolk Fenlands, which were once kind of a waterlogged area uh, with their own kind of culture. Um, they were heavily fished. I was quite surprised at some of the stats he put in the book about how much fish that we did used to get out of these fenlands before they were drained for agriculture in the 17th century onwards. Uh, he talks about as well the some of the birds that used to nest there which are, are very rare these days so black terns used to nest in large numbers, spoonbills used to let nest in huge numbers and spoonbills are quite interesting because um, the first pair to nest in 400 years in Yorkshire, where I live, uh, nested last summer. Uh, so this is a spoonbill is a huge heron uh, sized bird with, a, as the name suggests, a, a bill that is shaped like a, a spatula. Uh, so it's interesting to see how things go in cycles sometimes with these things. Uh, but he, he contrasts that kind of loss and change with uh, the rook, which is really the uh, continuity uh, species. And although he references the fact uh, that there were rookeries at one time in central London up to, surprisingly, the early 20th century, given this is a bird of the open field um, and farmland. But largely the rook has remained a constant um, in, you know, our countryside. And even down to the fact that some of the rookeries uh, the he looks at in the book have historic information that takes them back as a nesting site to the 16th century, 16th and 17th century. So the, the, this interesting contrast between loss and continuity or change in continuity. And I was reading Ali Smith's Autumn at the same time as I was reading this book. Uh, and it's quite interesting how that had some parallels really because uh, Ali Smith's Autumn plays with some of the same ideas of change in continuity and how your view on those can change with the perspective that you have, how far you stand back and look at things, I guess. So I think that's quite an interesting element uh, of this book. And the final bit, the final chapter, perhaps the weakest, and the reason I didn't give this a four or five stars, is a chapter where he looks at the nature of obsession. Um, his, his own obsession, but also giving other examples of other people, other bird watchers who've become obsessed with single species and some of the things they've achieved. Uh, and a kind of reflection on the fact that uh, this can at times be uh, therapeutic. He uses the example of studies on rooks that were done by POWs in German labour camps who would count the rooks going overhead as a kind of distraction from the daily slog of the hard labour. And finally, he talks about a the example of a priest um, who came back to Cornwall after being in the Australian penal colonies and seeing horrific sights over there, who again 
took up the sort of monitoring and observation of rooks as kind of part of his therapy. So all round, a really interesting book. Again, only 200 and odd pages, so a short read. Um, as I said before, I think this will probably resonate more with uh, bird watchers, but I think there's something for everybody in this book, and I highly uh, recommend people picking it up. So that was kind of um, my attempt at a new format. Hopefully uh, you that's worked. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you've read any of these books. Uh, please let me know uh, in the comments below and what you thought of them. Other than that, I will catch you in my next video. Bye.